Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting, uh, mid-December. This will be the last one for 2019. Where does the time go? And it's just gone. It's a long week. I mean, a long, uh, month, year? Year, yeah. <laughs> Decade, even. All right. Yeah. Let's hop on in. Uh, we got some new modules this time around, six to be specific. Uh, community contributor Mechella provided a new exploit module targeting vulnerable versions of online forum software v Bulletin. This particular vuln made a splash a few months back, even leading DEF CON to abruptly shut down their forums while they patched. This new module can achieve unauthenticated remote code execution on a vulnerable target by leveraging a flaw in the widget creation functionality, sending a post request with arbitrary data located in the widget config code parameter. Good stuff. Community contributor Honorer added a new exploit module targeting Agenti, which is an open source server administration app written in Python. Version 2.1.31 is vulnerable to command injection via the username post parameter, allowing an unauthenticated user to get a session on such a target. Rounding out our theme here of unvalidated inputs, community contributor Leo LB provided a new exploit module targeting the Plainview Activity Monitor WordPress plugin. Vulnerable versions of this plugin allow for remote code execution on the target via the IP post parameter, enabling an attacker with WordPress credentials to run code as the web server user. And if you'd like to see a demo of this module, there's actually one in the recording of, of the last uh, demo meeting up on YouTube. You can check it out. Let's see, contrib community contributor Wyatt Dahlenberg added a new post module for attempting authentication with Git servers using compromised SSH private keys, identifying the associated Git user if authentication does succeed. In the event of successful authentication, an attacker would have several paths forward, including downloading of private repos, or you know, adding and committing a backdoor to a public repo, or stuff like that. Very cool. Uh, community contributor Nicholas Stark provided a new auxiliary module for gathering remote files and data from targets running Chrome in headless mode with debugging enabled, which may mostly be developers, but who knows what you might find out there. No creds required, you just need to know the target address and debug port number. And I believe we'll have a demo of this. Last on our list, contributor, community contributor B. Coles added a new post module to dump the password hashes for all users on a BSD system. Enough said there. Very nice. And let's talk about uh, a lot of other valuable work going on. Uh, community contributor B. Coles added reliability and stability information to the MSF, sorry, MSO4 seven kill bill and MSO6 40 net API SMB exploit modules. Because also removed some post crypto methods, which as far as we could tell, have never actually been called anywhere in the last 10 years since they were added. Is that yeah. right, Brent? I looked it up, yeah. It, it, it was back when uh, we only had interpreter scripts, um, which is a different way of doing post exploitation APIs. Right. When, that, when the very first iteration of the post exploitation API got added, these functions got added, but no one ever bothered using them. So, right. hey, you know, yeah. 50 lines of code, in the bucket. Right, there you go. You gotta like it, make it a little bit more svelte. <laughs> Love it. Um, and speaking speaking to and of Brent Cook, he, uh, Brent updated the Kiwi extension used the latest Mimikatz release, which I think is like 2.2.0 November 20 something. something. Well, to be fair, OJ did most of the actual <laughs> hard work. I just did the final update, but okay. yeah, it's, <laughs> it's all in there. Thank you, OJ. A big shout out to OJ. Uh, we had two interpreter improvements from the community contributors as well, including uh, Tim WR. Tim Wright, I should say, improved the Espia screenshot support, and Hoodie added an install Android target to the interpreter make file. Super cool. And more. Uh, community contributor Henry Hoggart updated the GPG creds post gather module to support GPG keys version 2.1 and higher. And Brent Cook made some improvements based on analysis by the memory profiler gem, resulting in some improvements in memory usage and operations. Brent also updated compiled payloads to store generated files in a temporary location and delete them by default. And community contributor Fra updated the web delivery module, adding support for PowerShell AMSI bypass, which enables the web delivery module to bypass Windows Defender on Windows 10. Super cool. And more. Uh, our own Adam Kamek. Uh, I wrote words that don't make sense. I wrote Adam Kamek. <laughs> I wrote uh, words or you wrote words? No, I wrote, I wrote words that don't make sense. I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I wrote Adam Kamek. He, he updated the run RPC uh, API to now include vulnerability check results when you run a module that way. Very nice. 
community contributor, Ken LaCroix, uh, continues on his tear of, of module docs. He wrote docs for five new mod five new docs for five modules. Super cool. Man, Ken, shout out to Ken. Shout awesome. Out to Ken. Man. He's been Keep on tear. It. Yeah, love it. That helps helps users a lot. Uh, our own Jeffrey Martin updated credential reporting code to when when reporting credentials. I also set the associated task ID if one is present. And Jeffrey also made several improvements to workspace and framework, including commonizing on workspace as the key, specifying workspaces, and ensuring spawn handlers and spawn consoles do have a workspace attached. Thanks, Jeffrey, for your strict attention to detail. That's very helpful. <laughs> it is. It is. Absolutely. All right, and some bug fixes. Our own Dean Welch added a fix to ensure that scanner modules correctly report if they support check functionality. And in a similar vein, um, our own Adam Galway added a fix to ensure that auxiliary modules returned by search also correctly report if they support check functionality. Community, community contributor Hoodie dropped by with a quick fix for the Microsoft IIS FTP server encoded response overflow trigger module. That's a mouthful. To avoid crashing if no banner is returned by the target. And community contributor B. Coles updated the automatic TLS certi certificate generation logic to not generate certificates that have already expired. <laughs> Sounds like a fine fix. Uh, no, do love that. That's good. Fix it in two places, actually. So that's good. Go. Cool. And uh, our own Will Vu updated some of the suggested scripts provided when a user invokes deprecated interpreter scripts with more appropriate suggestions. It's been about five years since I think we deprecated interpreter scripts. I wonder when we should delete them for real. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I don't know. Uh -huh. mm. Good question. Yeah. Maybe right. that's what six. That's one of our questions. There you go. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's more bug fixes. Our oh my God! Fixed an issue with UUID <laughs> parsing. We have a lot uh, for payloads using UUIDs, so that's super cool. Community contributor Fra fixed an issue with the XOR dynamic encode, so it will raise a more appropriate exception when there is a bad character issue while encoding a payload, which fixed some MSF venom behavior people were seeing. Um, community contributor Phoenix H fixed an error in the credentials RPC command to avoid a nil object dereference. Uh, Phoenix H also fixed some minor bugs in the auto route and web delivery modules. Appreciate that. And our own Christophe de la Fuente added a fix to ensure upstream's valid method does work as expected. Woohoo, Christophe, yeah, thank you. Making the things work. And, all right, last slide of bug fixes, uh, which is awesome. Tributy, community contributor CNET and fixed the bypass UAC silent cleanup module to clean up the winder environment variable before calling the PowerShell payload. Nice fix there. Community contributor Mangy Coyote, I love that name. Fix the SSH creds gather module to be more thorough when checking directory and file access. I appreciate that. Community contributor Green M fixed the Redis unauth exec exploit module to bind to 0.0.0.0 if the module cannot bind to an added or load balanced address. Green M also took the opportunity to update the check method to report if the Redis version on the target cannot be determined. Dig it. And we also had three interpreter fixes come in via community contributors, including. Uh, Fra uh, added a fix to ensure the unhook extension works as expected. Max3 Raza uh, fixed a memory leak. And Plowsec fixed an address truncation issue with Windows X64 processes. For details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap up blog post at blog.rapid7.com. And as always, a huge thanks to all who helped make Metasploit better through their contributions. Thank you. And y'all saw the, I mean, we had a lot of slides today, so I really appreciate all that work, everybody. It's awesome. All right, I'll stop talking. Let's do the fun stuff. Let's do some demos. Mr. Brendan. Cool. Uh, so I'll preface this with this, this one actually landed after we cut the release. So it was, this, what we're seeing is, is will be in the, is, is available in master right now. Uh, I just didn't get cut in last Thursday's release. I think I have that right. So. All right, you just want me to hit, hit play on it, Brendan? Sure. Cool. So this came in from uh, Fra, and it's a pretty cool little tool. Uh, this was brought in by uh, the fact that you can, I think the, there's a program called Donut where you can remove the shell code from an EXE and just have the shell code. Um, and so in this particular case, this post module allows us to inject code directly into a process in Windows. We've done it with payloads before, but we've never done, done it with external tools. So in this case, I have a session on a Windows 10 machine. I'm setting up the, uh, the, the shell code. Uh, I have a bit of shell code I created that's just, uh, in this case, it is a MSF payload, just the shell code from the MSF uh, message box payload. And you can see over there, there was no message box. 
now I'm flailing and forgetting that I'm on session two. <laughs> yeah. As soon as session I get negative one, it, that's where all the third time is strong. And so in this case, we spawned a notepad process. Go over and look at the notepad process. You can't read it, but it says hello from MSF. Um, and that's pretty cool. Uh, the other thing that you can do with this is that it allows you to do to interact with the shell code itself. And so I have uh, I use the donut tool to create shell code for the command exe binary for Windows. And in this case, I'm going to set interactive to true and launch it. So now I'm in a command shell in Notepad. Um, those errors I was absolutely terrified of because they didn't come up in my original testing, but it turns out that that's sometimes what happens when you run command exe in the wrong place. So those are actually, those error messages are from command exe. They're not from our system. Okay, so it like, couldn't tell like what language you were in, so it couldn't, couldn't print a message properly. Right, I think the, the catch there is that it didn't have every, all the resources expected to have running in Notepad as opposed to a standalone. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't really blame it for that. <laughs> <laughs> you work with what you got, and you complain when you don't have it. Cool, any questions for Brendan? That's nice, I love, I love to see donut integration. That's, that's, uh, that's a cool tool. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is one of the things that happened from this is we did a quick rework of a lot of the shared code between this and the payload injection module. And that's all been offloaded to a library uh, in post Windows process that allows you to do a lot of this stuff. So anybody who's looking to write a module, check that out if you want to interact with Windows processes in a post module. Cool. Very cool. Neat. Anything else going once? All right. Thank you, Brendan. On to the Chrome debugger. Open for me, AKA Jeffrey. All right, let me see if I can get this share right. You should be able to grab it. Uh, or we'll see. Hey, we see two screens side by side. Hopefully they're readable. <laughs> they are, I think. I think your interrupt got, handler got killed, though. Uh, uh -uh. Better send something to MSF to have email to you. Yeah. Please. It'll be all right. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is a, a module that was uh, that was provided by Nicholas Stark, and he he went through the many iterations and uh, tribulations of trying to deal with me trying to review a code uh, a, a PR as we landed it. Um, uh, with, a, with a little bit of help, the, what this does is if a developer or in the, uh, in, in some cases, a test environment is set up to run testing against a remote Chrome, to Chrome instance, then they'll open up ports for uh, and possibly bind them to an open and listenable address. Um, in this case, I'm starting a Google Chrome instance that's listening on all, ad all, all IP addresses available on 92.22 and going to use our fun new use command so that I don't have to look very hard. Yay, I'm already in the, in the module. We look at our options. We simply need to set in our host and either a file path or a URL for what we're gonna, gonna, gonna pull back. This will, through the debugging session, will actually retrieve either a file that's on the system or go and make an uh, HTTP request to some other systems. So if we were to set, uh, let's actually just set URL to web.com and we were to set our host to, and since the port is already the default, I can just run it from here goes out and makes a request. We can actually see the request happen over on the dev console. We can see the details come back. There's a little bit of a delay as the, um, uh, the event machine that's being used uses a standard default timeout that's actually configurable. Um, and it'll wait 10 seconds to get back a response. This way, if you have a really large file or something, uh, uh, or something along those lines that needs, needs a little extra time to be returned, then we'll have the opportunity to be able to expand on the options. Um, Another option is a file path. Let's just get random file. I'll wait for it. 
Tres. We can see we were able to retrieve a random <laughs> file from my remote system. Nice. Isn't that fun? That's beautiful. <clears throat> That'll do it. I think there's another neat thing about this, right? That, um, that along with this uh, module, this also adds an interesting new library to Metasploit that developers might be able to take advantage of. It does. It adds uh, it adds event machine and the dependencies re related to it, so that others can take advantage of event machine in other places. I think there's actually already a comment on the PR about uh, someone else's uh, idea on how to commonize some code using the using the event machine architecture. Yeah. So it looks like this will be a, a neat kind of stepping stone to some other cool stuff too. So yes, yeah, nice. Thanks, Nick, and thanks, Jeffrey. Yeah. Thank you, Jeffrey. Any other questions for Jeffrey? No one wants. Cool. All right. We have a demo from Christoph. Mass profile persistence. Christoph, you want to let me unshare and you can grab it? Sure. Um, so I'm going to share this. Here we go. Yeah. Yep. So um, this module uh, is um, actually a, a module that helps to get uh, persistence on, on a remote machine by um, adding a line to the uh, um, shell configuration file, uh, for example, bash. And uh, so what, what it does is, is it's just like uh, uploading a, a payload to some uh, directory and uh, execute it uh, when a user is actually starting a shell session. So for example, if you SSH to, 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 to a machine, you're gonna start your uh, shell session and it will execute uh, the, the payload to communicate back to, to you. So this is pretty straightforward, but this can be very useful. Um, so here we go. So you need a session. So here is a simple SSH, uh, SSH session uh, to the remote host. And uh, so, yeah, it is, it is called bash, uh, uh, bash profile persistence module, but you actually, you can use it with a other kind of, of shell, uh, um, just setting the, the correct uh, bash profile file and, uh, and uh, it will work fine. Um, so you, are, you have to set the, the payload directory as well and also the session. Okay, so, uh, so what it does, it just uh, writes the, the trigger code to the uh, um, bash RC file. Also, it will uh, create a backup of this file before doing this in case you want to roll back, um, you want to go to the previous state of, of the file. Um, and uh, yeah, it uploads the, the payload. So now you just have to start your handler and wait for someone starting a, a bash session. So here, I'm gonna SS, simply SSH to the machine. Here we go. And uh, yeah, that's it. So you have a shell session here. So obviously I forgot to, to set the bed operator. So I'm gonna upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, just uh, look at the, I'm gonna look at the configuration file, how it looks. So the last line actually is just uh, launching the, the payload, which is in the slash var slash TMP. And that's it. Super cool. Um, any questions for Christoph? No, I, I guess I will note that um, uh, sometimes uh, if you use that kind of module in, a, in an offensive way, um, sometimes var temp and temp get deleted um, on reboot, so you might want to double check that um, the, the 
those are not mounted as like a RAM file system or, or something that gets cleared out um, on reboot um, if you want that to persist beyond that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you can you can set up which uh, maybe there's some uh, temporary directory you have uh, write access and then, which is more stable than, than this one. Yeah, and I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll mention that this module, similar to the one that um, Brendan demoed, uh, landed recently, that is available in, in master uh, right now, but is not part of the release we cut last, last Thursday. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you, Christoph. Thanks. Excellent.